would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians on whose country I present from today, the Durumbul people, and pay my respects to their elders, past and present. I would like to extend that acknowledgement to the traditional custodians on whose country uh, you are participating from today. Now for a quick overview on how we will run today. To start, we will all be using Slido, S-L-I-D-O, Slido, for some public service trivia. Then we'll have a keynote address from the Australian Public Service Deputy Commissioner, Shubo Banerjee. Then we will hear some stories from the APS, followed by a short panel discussion with two of my SES colleagues, and then your questions will be answered by the panel. All your questions, if you've got questions, they can be submitted uh, via the Q&A function on Slido. There is a QR code on the screen now. That will take you to Slido. Simply take out your mobile and scan the code. You can also enter the number on the screen at Slido's website to join from your browser. So just take a little bit of time to um, scan that code or enter into Slido's website via the browser. Uh, for those of you who are on the site, you should see the first question now. What is the most common male name in Australia? There's 20 seconds on the clock for everyone to answer before we show you the correct answer. So I'm going to have to look down now because I've got to go to my slide, Slido screen. So most common male name. And I'm just waiting for the answer to come through. It's Michael. There you go. Second question. What is the most common female name? Again, you've got 20 seconds on the clock to answer that question. I'm guessing it's not AJ. Oh, and I'm just being reminded that this question is for public servants in Queensland. So what is the most common female name for public servants in Queensland? Oh my goodness. And the answer is Michelle. Michael and Michelle. Going to the third question, what is the average age of APS employees in Queensland? 20 seconds on the clock. I'm guessing it's not going to be 56, which is how old I am. No. Here's the answer, 44 years of age. And the last uh, trivia question for this morning, what are the top three countries where APS employees in Queensland were born outside of Australia? That's a tough one. Maybe New Zealand. Here we go. Whoa, I was right. England, New Zealand, and India. 
So thanks for playing along. Um, that was all very interesting. I would now like to invite Shubo Banerjee, the Australian Public Service De Deputy Commissioner, to deliver the keynote address. Over to you, Shubo. With you all this morning, uh, I'm coming to you from the lands of the Ngunnawal people here in Canberra, and I pay my respects to their elders past and present and extend uh, that acknowledgement to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, staff who are joining us on the call today and more generally in the uh, public service. I'm really excited to have the chance to join you this morning. I'm a little bit disappointed that I can't do so in Queensland. Any excuse to go up to Queensland is always a good one, but I am joining you from Canberra. And uh, one of the benefits, of course, of doing this online is to draw in people from all over the place, uh, both for me to dial in from Canberra, but also, of course, conscious that public servants are uh, located all the way across Queensland. In fact, as we get into the panel, we'll see that we've got a little bit of geographic representation even amongst us today. I'm looking forward to having a further conversation with AJ, uh, Jess and Sybil later on as well. The State of the Service uh, Roadshow is an opportunity for us to come together as public servants to reflect a little bit uh, on our experiences, to hear a little bit about the external environment, but also to share experiences and to share our stories together. And so today, to get us underway, I just thought I'd provide some framing remarks. Uh, as AJ mentioned, I'm uh, relatively newly appointed. I'm just over a month in as the Deputy Commissioner uh, head of the APS Academy and Capability here at the APSC. Uh, I was previously a long-time public servant, uh, but I've also had stints outside the public service, most recently at the Australia, at the Australian New Zealand School of Government. But uh, a, a little while ago now, I did actually also spend two years up in Cairns at the Cape York Institute uh, on secondment from the APS at that stage. So uh, a little bit of Queensland experience and certainly a lot of Queensland delight. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to start with today was really to talk again and acknowledge just how complex the external operating environment has been for the APS. Uh, just some of the challenges over the last year, of course we had the ongoing economic and social challenges from the after effects of COVID-19. We've been hit uh, across the country by a sequence of natural disasters and uh, the response to those has taken uh, an enormous effort across government, across the community. We've had recent geopolitical disruptions across the world that have had uh, ongoing effects uh, across the economy, across society and into our international environment. And we're also very conscious of competing in a tight labour market with national skill shortages and all the implications that come from that. So the APS is on an ongoing reform journey. And the government has set out uh, its particular priorities in that reform journey. It's looking to the APS to be an organisation that embodies integrity in everything that it does, puts people and business at the centre of policy and services, is a model employer and has the capability to do its job well. And so we're doing a lot of work here at the APSC and in partnership with the APS Reform Office in PMNC to support a reform program all the way across the APS to make sure that we can build uh, our capability, build our uh, capacity, build, our, build the way in which we can do our work uh, so that we can serve the Australian people as effectively as possible, uh, working through the government uh, through the parliament to serve the Australian people. One of the ways in which we continue to grow and develop as a public service is through the APS Academy, which is a function that I have responsibility for here in the APSC. The Academy provides an integrated whole of service approach to learning and development for the APS. Uh, review after review has talked about how important thinking about capability is for the APS. The APS employee census over and over again talks about how important it is to public servants to continue to learn and grow in their jobs. And the APS Academy is an opportunity to really connect all the way across the service, both in terms of thinking about what constitutes excellence as a public servant, but also then how you can get the support to continue to learn and improve and do your job better over time. We're taking very much a networked approach 
we're very conscious that there are, there's excellence all the way across the public service. We're looking to connect into that excellence to really tailor offerings so that they are meaningful to people on the ground and really think about how you can do that in a way that takes advantage of the deep domain knowledge and expertise that exists all the way across the service. The idea is not to provide a centralised uh, function that somehow tries to do everything from Canberra for everyone, but instead tries to listen, tries to think about different ways, different platforms in which public servants can be supported wherever they are for whatever their job is and trying to get better over time, both individually but also as organisations, to be a learning organisation for the APS as a whole. In thinking about uh, the performance of the APS, of course we're always conscious of putting integrity right at the centre of everything that we do. Integrity is really the core of the APS craft. It really goes to what is the special central part of the vocation. We do things in trust for the Australian government, uh, for the public, and we need to think about taking that responsibility extremely seriously. The APS has a high standard of integrity and professionalism, and we're also looking to safeguard and build on this over time. The APSC continues to deliver practical initiatives to build and support an integrity culture across the APS uh, in partnership with agencies all the way across the service. The Commission's published an integrity metrics resource, which I'd encourage you to have a look at. It was designed to support agencies to understand their current integrity standing and to help them make informed decisions on where to focus their future effort. Integrity, of course, is a fundamental practice that needs to be practised by all of us, as does leadership. The Commission puts a lot of time and effort into thinking about leadership, leadership at all levels, not just those that are designated senior, level, uh, senior leaders, but also what it means to exercise leadership at different levels in the public service. How can you exercise some agency? How can you think about your responsibilities and how can you do that responsibly within the Westminster construct and within the construct of integrity that applies to all of us as public servants? The new Secretary's uh, Charter of Leadership Behaviours applies all the way across the public service. And again, I'd encourage you to have a look at that. One of the things that's of particular interest to us in the Commission is mobility across the service to make sure that we really do provide opportunities for public servants to serve in a range of different roles in a range of different ways so that they can, they can make full use of the rewarding professional path that is possible within the public service. We've released a mobility framework in 2021 and we're thinking a lot about uh, different mechanisms to support that, including the surge reserve and other temporary opportunities. Something that I thought I'd mention on the way through today is uh, also that there is work underway in the Museum of Australian Democracy to support a new APS exhibition, which is due to open in August this year. We're really looking forward to seeing the spirit of service reflected in that exhibition, and I'd encourage any of you that are coming through Canberra to have a look. It's looking tremendous in its preparation. Another thing that I thought I'd mention is the APS workforce strategy and the ongoing work that's been done through the APSC Centre of Excellence in Workforce Planning to build capability all the way across the service. We take very seriously the idea that we need to look over the horizon, think about the challenges that are still uh, on their way, and think about how we can develop deep uh, specialist expertise in domains that we know are coming, are in demand, but also lift the core to make sure, strengthen the core to make sure that everyone is supported to do the work that they need to do. There's a lot of work underway in supporting the Secretary's Subcommittee on the Future of Work, and in particular we're thinking a lot about flexible work and how that can apply all the way across the public service. One of the things that I'm sure will come up through the panel discussion is how we think about flexibility in location, as well as flexibility in work mode, and thinking about how we can support teams and team managers and leaders to, to, uh, to deliver most effectively in this flexible work paradigm. I think in many ways it really comes to going back to some fundamentals that we know about good team management and leadership. We need to be really clear with teams about what we're trying to do, how we're trying to do it, how, how tasks are allocated, what overall success looks like. These are things that we all know, but they're particularly acute in a flexible work paradigm, I think. And it's really making us go back to some basics and making sure that we do those basics very, very well. 
We're also thinking about the employee value proposition, what makes us proud to serve as public servants, and how you can make a contribution as a public servant in so many different ways. There are so many different career paths in the public service, and indeed, uh, there are many ways in which you can come in and out, as I've done in my career, make a contribution for a short or a long period of time. That kind of flexibility is also important to thinking about what we're trying to do in the public service. In closing, 2023 will continue to be a big year for the APS and things don't look to be slowing down anytime soon. I encourage you to uh, not only continue the important work that you do in your own areas, but also to take a, a little bit of time to look around to see what else is being developed in the public service, take a bit of a broader interest in the public service as an institution and the role that it plays in national life. And in doing so, also make sure that you're taking the time to take care of yourselves and of each other. Thanks very much, AJ. Thanks, Shubo. That was great. And certainly a number of the issues that you raised, I know, will are near and dear to members of the Australian Government Leadership Network uh, in Queensland. So I would be very surprised if we don't have a number of really great questions and ideas around those issues, particularly mobility, capability and leadership. We discuss these often uh, around the management committee for that network. Um, the State of the Service, moving, moving along, the State of the Service Roadshow is an annual occasion where we come together and talk through ideas for the public service. We can also share our stories and experience a little bit um, in terms of reflecting on your experience in Cairns, Shubo. Um, the APSC is capturing some of these stories. I was not aware of this before getting ready for this roadshow. We will now show a trailer of some of the stories captured so far. I work at the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, and this is my story. Hello, my name is Ben. My name is Sanam Safar. Yeah, my name is Hannah. My name is Mohammed al -Abri. I'm Grant Nicholson. My name is Robin Edmonds. My name's Andrew Pfeiffer. Hey there, my name is Belle Hogg. My name is Megan Kopatz, and this is my APS story. So I got to uh, talk to different agencies, see inside uh, their cultures and their initiatives and what they were doing. And I thought, wow, there's so much going on in the APS. I, I really need to uh, broaden my horizons. Starting out in service delivery, taking calls from Australians who were unemployed and hearing some stories that broke my heart. And that really started off a very um, rewarding time being able to help the Australian public, and that hasn't changed. Um, there's plenty of opportunity around now. They've got some, a thing called the a Development Register, that if you're interested in developing your career and working your way up from maybe as a team leader. I continue to learn and share all around government uh, through the amazing communities that, that I've been involved with. Um, there's a, um, a thing called the Digital Profession and I'm running a visual scribing community. So um, we have local, state, federal, all kinds of um, different government agencies, departments um, that come together. The advice that I would give to people is um, do experience uh, time in other organisations. It's well worth it to uh, uh, expand your horizons and to go and, and spend time discovering what other agencies do and, and sharing your talent around. But at the same time, if, you, if you're comfortable in the organisation you are, you can, you're adding value there, there is value for the organisation in you staying for a period of time in the organisation. Bring like-minded people together. We share webinars, we bring in speakers and we hold events like closed swaps. The next big event we're trying to hold is an APS-wide uh, event for Clean Up Australia Day on the 5th of March 2023. We hope to see you there. I started up their Neurodiversity Network, which grew to 400 members in one year. And I was super thrilled that the ATO supported me in co-founding their network. And so we decided to bring people together for a bit of a meeting just to explore what it was that agencies were already doing, what they were maybe aware of, what they thought were opportunities, what they really wanted to learn. So we kind of wanted to have this exploratory meeting just to, I guess, gauge the level of interest and maturity, if you will, right, with, with neurodiversity awareness and inclusion across the APS. So there was so much support because I was at the learning stage, people were there to support me, help me, 
gaming, like the network and development opportunities, but within APS6 is something I have to find on my own. Uh, but it's really amazing and challenging for me because this, this was something I was looking for, that where I can challenge myself, get out of the comfort zone and uh, maybe an inspiration for others. My highlight was definitely the evaluation workshop I led because it directly led to the agency changing its HR processes in a meaningful way. So I thought it was very impactful. My key takeaway from this whole experience work on the project is that each and every person has the power to create change. So I hope you enjoyed the, those um, videos, everybody. We're now going to move into our panel discussion, um, arguably the juiciest part of the, the roadshow road today. Just a reminder, if you have a question for the panel, can you please pop it into the Q&A function in Slido? And if you see a question that, that you like, um, vote it up you can do that in Slido. And it's it, the more votes, the more likely that question is, is going to be asked uh, and answered. So now I would like to introduce the panelists in addition to Shubo today. Um, please join me on the virtual stage, Jessica Hamilton, General Manager of External Communications and Marketing at, Austra uh, at Austrade and Investment Commission. And Sibylla McCoon, who's one of my colleagues from the Australian Bureau of Statistics uh, as Program Manager for Location Insights Branch in the ABS. So thank you all for joining me today. I have a couple of questions to start off uh, the panel before we'll throw to questions which I'm sure are streaming in from the audience. And do excuse me if I look down because I need to check Slido for any questions that might be coming through. So uh, first question for the panel today, thinking about our APS reform priorities and the APS becoming a model employer, as Shubo mentioned, let's turn to flexible work. Now this can mean different things in different agencies. How do you see flexible work applied in your agency? I'll throw to you first, Jessica. Thanks, AJ. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'd just like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land of which I'm on today, the Kondamooka people, um, before uh, and, and acknowledge their elders past and present, and of course, extend um, that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that are on the call today. Uh, for a little bit of context to my answer, I do work for the Australian Trade and Investment Commission or Austrade. We are a unique service delivery agency and we have over 1300 staff located in 107 offices in 66 countries. So even before the pandemic, we had a very dispersed and a very diverse organisation It's and or workforce. And it's actually one of the reasons that I wanted to come and work for Austrade. We have a number of roles that need to be done in a, physically in an office. Others can be 100% remote, such as the trade starters that we have living and working in regional community, communities, helping Australian businesses export. But the majority of our roles are actually hybrid. So they do a little bit of work from home and work from the office. Um, and we ask that they do no more than two days of work from home. Those three days don't necessarily always in the office either. Because we're service delivery, many, many of our people are actually on site with their clients as well. So we have people being where they need to be to service our, our the businesses who are our constituents, our, our citizens in the most effective way. For us here in Queensland though, it's a bit of an interesting uh, dilemma that we have. Uh, when I joined Austrade nearly five years ago, we had just over 30 staff in, in Brisbane. That's now pushing nearly 150 and we have only a small office and we can't accommodate all of our people in the office at one point in time. So we're having, we've got um, remote um, hot desking situation where you've got to book desks um, and a lot of coordination that happens at a team and at a divisional level to make sure that we're bringing people together so that they can work with their colleagues in productive work. The design and the structure of work has taken some change, like it makes work to make it work. You know, you do the work that you need to do deep work on days when you are working from home and when you need to collaborate 
it is easier and it is better doing it when you're in person. But it's not always that you're working with your team and everyone's in Queensland. Quite often you'll have staff members from right across um, the agency in other locations and including globally. So there is a lot of flexibility. We're very lucky that we have the technology platforms that allow us to do that. But it's, it's not easy and we keep learning and growing and adjusting to what our staff need and want from us to make that flexible working, but to make sure that they do have connectivity because um, I know um, I used to work from the office all the time. I never worked from home, but I find now having that flexibility is something that really enhances my employment um, and my productivity and my effectiveness and efficiency, both as a delivery, but also from a leadership perspective. So uh, it's not easy. It takes work, uh, but that's sort of some of the experience and the approach that we're taking at Austrade. Yeah, Jessica, that's fantastic. And, you know, certainly as, as we were sharing, getting ready for this uh, session today, I'm, I'm able to beam in from Yapoon, which yeah. is not where I, I normally work, right? And it, it's just very seamless with the technology that we have uh, available to the APS nowadays. Sibylla, did you want to add something um, to, to what Jessica's shared? Yeah, sure. Hi, AJ, and hi, everyone out there. It's... um. A little bit daunting thinking there's 1800 of you out there but um thankfully we can pretend there's only the, the five or six of us on the screen here um yeah and i just want to start also by acknowledging the turbo uh, people and the custodians of the land that i'm on today here close to brisbane um and as as both jessica and aj have mentioned it's nice to see the diversity um across the lands that we're on today um so in terms of flexible work in my experience um Certainly, it's both about where people work and when people work. Um, you know, Jessica's already talked a little bit about the um, the where people work, office versus home. Um, in in my experience in the ABS, I guess I just wanted to share some of my where where examples and as an example of flexible work and, and um, what the public service offers us. So um, I've worked in multiple locations as um, an employee of the APS. So I've worked in Canberra, I've worked in Darwin, um, and now working in Brisbane. So I've had that, that ability to work in flexibly different locations, um, different work program, which has been great. Um, Certainly, I take advantage of the working from home arrangements. I do one to two days at home, which is a really great way to balance um, workload and life load um, and those kind of things that we all experience with um, our various circumstances. And now also, um, since probably about November last year, I've also taken advantage of um, flexible hours in a sense. So I work nine day, a nine-day fortnight, so every second Friday I negotiated to have that off gone a little bit part-time, made arrangements with my team. So, so that works in practice. And again, that's a really great initiative that I love. I absolutely love having every second Friday off, long weekend every second Friday, but it makes me a better, makes me a better um, human, it makes me a better person in the workplace, um, having that kind of balance so I can manage the workload and, um, and life load at the same time. So um, as I said, it's, it's where people work, um, it's uh, when people work, which applies to part-time, um, compressed arrangements, all kinds of things that are, are happening in the ABS at the moment. And I think it really goes to, um, you know, the APS reform initiatives about being a model employer, giving people those opportunities, but also um, in terms of attracting and retaining staff, being able to make the most of the diversity that we get from having people across different locations when with different life experiences, accommodating that through flexible arrangements, I think can only make us stronger as a public service. Yeah, that's great. And I agree wholeheartedly. Why don't we stay with you, Sibylla, and I'll go to the second question. So uh, for everybody out there, learning and development opportunities can be formal and informal in the public service. What are some of the informal training, Sibylla, you have done that has been useful in your career? Sure, okay. Um, so there's a couple of things I wanted to draw out here. So one of the most useful things that I've done um, from an informal learning point of view is coaching, um, working with an external coach,
really valuable to sort of have that kind of intense time where you're focused on what you're something specific you're trying to achieve, being able to step out of the busyness of your day to day and really focus on something with someone who kind of pushes you and challenges you in a way that um, that is really beneficial. So um, coaching I've found really, really helpful. Um, the other the other side of it is um, mentoring, I thought I'd also mention, and that's um, both in terms of having a, a network of colleagues who who sort of I have a more of an informal mentoring arrangement with, you know, those trusted people that you can go to for advice and feedback on, on tr tricky issues or challenging situations, um, but also taking the opportunity to mentor others. I've found that one of the most beneficial ways to learn because as you're working with others and reflecting on your own experiences and what you can share, you're kind of forced into that um, that self-development, self-reflection mode um, in, in sharing with others. So um, that's that's the second thing I wanted to mention. Um, and the last thing that I found, um, well, not the last thing I found useful, but the last thing I thought I'd share with you, otherwise you'll hear from me all day long. Um, it's really about being driven by curiosity. So I look, um, I basically follow my nose on things like podcasts and books that are sort of relevant to um, relevant to work or not relevant to work, but stretch your minds in different ways and, and give you that growth opportunity, give you different perspectives on, on what's going on um, that in our external environment um, that really make you think and grow, I guess, in different ways. So I think um, when I think about my learning there, it has been very much um, led by curiosity and interest and I've always been led to beneficial outcomes there. I guess it's that self-driven um, way of learning that is really, really valuable. So yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. Absolutely, curiosity. Uh, we won't talk about the cat, but certainly very important. <laughs> um, Jessica, did you want to share something with us on that front? Learning and development and informal uh, training or experiences throughout your career. Absolutely happy to AJ, and I just want to second um, one of the things that Seville said. Absolutely, um, mentoring others, coaching others, supporting others—you can learn so much about yourself by helping others. Um, in fact, that's probably been some of my my significant, you know, aha moments when you realise something about yourself and what you've learned, and you realise how far you, far you've come. It can be a great confidence booster as well, and sometimes that's a big part of it. It's about that enhancing your mindset. Um, and so I just want to uh, call out that that's a really great one. For me, uh, a lot of the informal bit has come down to the everyday practice of reflection. Uh, and it's what, um, even when you have a meeting, uh, what did what went well? What could we have done better to have made it a, a, a better decision or that process better or for more diverse voices to have been heard or for it to have been a quicker decision or more dis discussed or deliberated? How could we have made it better? And I think it's a really important practice to adopt and it's important to ask for feedback too about how you can do things differently. And that everyday practice is something that I have learned and grown from significantly. And I've heard from coaches and mentors, um, but as well as just discussing it with your own team members, it doesn't, it could be a peer, it could be your team. Um, reflecting on those things is part of embracing that growth mindset. And I think it was towards the end of the last year, there was um, a release of some actual empirical research, you know, peer reviewed paper that talked about that that's actually how wisdom is gathered. It's about the everyday experience and it's the practice of the number of lessons that you've learned from doing things that actually makes you wise. It has nothing to do with your age nothing to do with your age. It has everything to do from learning from the experiences, good, bad, or indifferent, that will actually help you grow. And so, um, yeah, it's the everyday bit for me that I think I wanted to share. And I think is it, it has been as relevant for me in my private sector career. I was spent about 18 years in, in industry and working in the private sector before I joined the APS nearly five years ago, as it has been in, in my time in the public service. Yeah, fantastic. That's um, really invaluable kind of reminder about the importance of being in the present, you know, thinking about what you've done and, and what's worked well, what you could improve. I really, I really like that. It's a good reminder for me. I might take that as a snippet from today, Jessica. Um, now, we have, I have one question that's come through um, from uh, registrants 
in the roadshow today. Shubo, I think this one really is for you. So I'm hoping that we can um, uh, switch to you. Uh, the question is, obviously some positions need to be centralised, but what is being done across the APS to capitalise on regional talent outside of Brisbane and major urban areas? Thanks, AJ. Uh, happy to, to um, start an answer on this, uh, but then also refer it on a little bit. The, the start of the answer is, of course, the proposition is uh, of, of course right, that there are uh, extremely talented people uh, who are based in uh, all, all over the state. And Queensland, of course, is a very, very big state, as uh, I kept re being reminded when, when I was living up there. Uh, and so to, to have a concerted effort to think about how you can tap into talented, experienced, uh, knowledgeable people all the way across the state is incredibly important. I think what that looks like um, on the ground really does depend on the agency and it depends on the type of work and it depends on uh, where that work can be done and how you can look to go about it. I think the overall message that we're looking that comes out very much through the panel discussion so far is that the, the ethos has got to be a constructive look at this. How, how can flexibility apply uh, across different positions and how can it apply in a way that works for individuals, that works for teams and works for organisations? So, so that's the kind of overarching principle that's at stake here. And then the specifics do depend on the specifics of the job, the specifics of the agency what work needs to be done, where, in what kind of way, and really trying to weigh all those different things up, but with a constructive mindset of how can we look to make this work in a way that is genuinely flexible, that taps into talent all the way across the state, that makes the most of people's potential uh, according to what their life circumstances are and where they are. Now, I think that the, in one way that sounds kind of conceptual high level, but I think uh, setting, setting the principles for these sorts of things really does make a difference because the, I think we've seen circumstances where people start with a much more closed mindset. We couldn't possibly do that. We've never done it that way before. How could we possibly? Whereas I think uh, now there is a much more open sense, and it's partly post-COVID and the experiences that we all went through through COVID, but there's a much more open sense of let's really think about what is practically important and necessary to make this work rather than some sort of ingoing we couldn't possibly. Now, that's not to say all circumstances are going to work for all people. That's just not the case. It does depend on the particular type of work. But I think an openness, a willingness to have that conversation in a mutually beneficial kind of way is really important. Yeah, thank yeah, you, Shubo. And I, I was, as you were talking, I was reflecting on the ABS's experience during COVID. And um, certainly I have um, 110 staff, 50% of them are in Melbourne. And um, the mindset of that team was very much office-based work. And we were very concerned when we had to pivot pretty immediately to working from home. And to be quite truthful, they did it in a heartbeat. It was just so easy. And I think that's a really good point about mindset because, um, you know, again, I'm, I'm in Yapoon today, a part of a national event and, and you wouldn't even know. So, uh, so that's the issue of place, but technology is enabler and, and mindset is really important. Sibylla, did you want to add anything um, from an ABS or a personal perspective to what Shubo has shared? I would just support everything Shubo just said. You know, it's really coming with a how might we type mindset that's certainly been my experience you know every person is different every team is different the work that needs to be done so taking all those things to into account and rather than having hard and fast rules a how might we type conversation is the place to start and what I've seen work well and we've we've come up with some really great creative solutions there for um, good outcomes all around um, and I think that's that's what we're seeing shift is as you say from a oh my goodness, my goodness we couldn't possibly to okay how might we do it what would yeah. we need?
Yeah, fantastic. Jessica, did you want to add anything from your experience? Uh, no, nothing to add. I think they're great, great answers. Okay, Thanks. great. So next question is, can you provide an update on the intent and process behind the APS wide bargaining? So I think this is for you, Shubo. Thanks, AJ. Uh, so I'll, I'll start by saying that uh, this is a formal process. And so uh, I, I will provide some high level answers, but, but not get into uh, a whole lot of detail here because the formal process is just really kicking off. There are resources available to keep up to date, including a newsletter. And so we can post that through the chat and subsequently to, uh, to this conversation uh, because we're really encouraging input and we're encouraging people to stay connected. So uh, very, very keen for people to have a good picture of this, but also conscious that there's only so much I can say for today. Uh, the government has indicated that it would like to move to a more common basis for bargaining, that there has been a proliferation of different arrangements all the way across the service. And so instead, they would like to look to uh, something that provides a little bit more consistency, but it's a very large service. It's 160,000 people, many, many agencies. And so then, of course, the work is in thinking through exactly how that will work in practicality. Peter Reardon uh, at the Australian Public Service Commission is the lead negotiator for that process. And he has indicated publicly that he expects that formal process to be underway by the end of March. And I know that uh, various precursor processes are currently happening around that to make sure that the communication occurs correctly, that there is proper consultation and all of that is followed properly. But beyond that, I can't really talk to the detail of it because it is a, a formal service-wide bargain. Yeah, that, that's um, understandable, Shubo, and thank you for providing the information that you could. Um, obviously, very important process for um, APS staff. Um, next question, and I'm going to throw it to you, Jessica. What skills do you think the APS workforce will need to develop for the future world of work? Oh, it's an excellent question. <laughs> um, I might add in my profession into this answer. Um, I'm a marketing and communications expert. That's what I've spent my life doing. It's what I'm deeply passionate about, um, being able to reach audiences to communicate complex information so that they can understand it. And then if required, um, that is always, you know, changing a mind or a mindset and also encouraging them to do something, to think, feel or do something differently as a result. I think the work that the APSC has done on professions and on capabilities is excellent. And I would encourage you all, Subo mentioned earlier that that integrity model that talks about that integrity sits at the core of who we are and what we do as APS. It is excellent because that is regardless of what level you're at, what job you do, which agency, it's, it's, that's what binds us. That's what we're here for. So the integrity, the service and the impartiality, absolutely a core. Um, and there's great work on, on the competencies. There's wonderful work that's been done in digital. And I would particularly like to note also the work that's been done on encouraging more female representation in the digital profession. I spent some time working in that area while I was at Austrade and there's some great work being done there. There's a lot more to do, but it is a really, that is where we have the most pressure in terms of um, a labour market as well too, in digital and in data, but there's some great work being done there. I, I would love to see us um, uh, recognise and embrace communications and marketing um, as, as a core skill set um, of the APS, uh, not only for those professionals that do those jobs every day, but also because it's a competency that we all have as leaders and as practitioners. It is our job to communicate with our colleagues, with our boss, with our team members, with those in other agencies and, and through different various digital channels as well. And I, I do see that as a core competency that's a really important one across the APS. And I think it would be a great opportunity for us to, to look at that moving forward. Um, and I, I do also think those sort of core competencies, you've always got a something that you're good at, something that you're passionate about. And to find what that is, um, is a really beautiful thing in your career. But then as you get 
as you move up the ranks, sometimes that becomes less important and it's more about your ability to lead. Um, it's your ability to navigate complexity, to, to manage a team, to manage change um, or, or a, a pandemic <laughs> or a bushfires, which is where the crisis started for us from an Austrade perspective back in 2020. So it's really important that you, um, we all, you know, those I and T-shaped people, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that concept, but to, to learn those general skills as well and be able to apply them and be very much ready for anything. It's that capability to be able to remain calm, to think through an issue. Critical thinking is really important. And I think when we talk about integrity and we talk about dealing with uncertainty and pressure, um, sometimes it could we could be quick to rush to a decision or an assumption, but we really need to make sure that we take the time to practice those critical thinking skills. And it may just be as simple as just stopping and going what, why, when, how, where, just really simple things, but taking the time to do it properly so that then we can move forward and remaining calm in those things. I think that's something that the APS has demonstrated an incredible capability to do. Um, what what has been achieved is, as Subo mentioned earlier, about the, the external challenges that we've had to face and the response that this um, across the APS that we've seen across the agencies has been extraordinary. So how do we strengthen that? And, um, and, and uh, uh, that needs to happen at all levels as well. So I could talk about this forever, <laughs> but I'll just, I'll stop there. And, and they're, they're probably my a couple of contributions to get the conversation started. Yeah, fantastic, Jessica. And community Communication, I agree with you. I mean, this is something that I and my team have been working on for some time because the part of the statistical business that I'm responsible for, statistical infrastructure, is not sexy. And so it's been, well, how do we how do we get across how important it is so that, you know, we're not forgotten in investment and discussions and planning and prep. So a lot of hard work we, th that we've been doing, still a lot more to do in terms of communication and stakeholder engagement, you know, getting the word out, helping people understand uh, the context within which we operate and, and what does that mean for, for data and statistics and the country. Um, Sibylla, I know that that we talk about this often in in the ABS. You know, what are the future skills um, of of the workforce? Did you want to add something to Jessica's um, response? Thanks, AJ. Um, and Jessica, I'm so glad you mentioned data, of course, being from the AVS, I'm going to say data. <laughs> so, but I actually wanted to go off in a little bit of a different tangent. Tangent. When I think about um, the future of work, I often think about um, the future of our external environment. Um, you know, it's been touched on in terms of, um, you know, we're in a very dynamic world. It's going to get even more interesting and, and dynamic from a um, climate change and natural disaster perspective. And I think what we're going to need is um, that agility to really, as a, as a workforce, to be able to um, to shift as we need to respond quickly to a, a more dynamic external environment. And when I bring that back to within an organisation, I think about, um, you know, I think it's it's fairly emerging in, in our space, but um, it's how we structure our work. It's how we, I think a lot of us, I don't know if this resonates, it certainly resonates with a lot of people I speak to, but it's that people feeling like we're in this constant run, um, meeting to meeting, to email, to, to message, to, you know, there's this world of digital distraction out there. Um, when we're in a time where we actually need to have um, those moments of reflection, as Jessica mentioned, um, the ability to step out and go ask those those core questions in that that increasing dynamic work, uh, world. So, how do we how do we structure our work so we have time to do that deep thinking so that we can um, be focused on the most important priorities? I think. Um, the technology has probably gotten a bit of ahead of our, our way of working. Um, so when I think about the future of work, I think it's us catching up with the, the technology so it works for us instead of us working for the technology um, in that world where we're going to have to be um, much better at, at, at having that focus time and finding that focus time so we can respond to that dynamic world around us. Yeah, that's a great reflection. And interestingly enough, it resonates very well with me. Um, this year, I've decided to block out nine to 10 every day for focus time and three to five on a Friday. And we very much try and 
not use that time for anything else. Um, you've got to be a bit flexible, you've got to be a bit agile, but trying to get out of that back to back meeting um, syndrome. And certainly I'm, I'm asking my directors and my teams to do something very similar. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Shuba, did you, as the, the lead for the APS Academy, did you want to add anything um, to what Sibylla and Jessica have said? Yeah, thanks, AJ. Uh, and as both Sibylla and, and Jessica have said, it's such a great topic that it's a whole session in and of itself, I think. Um, but perhaps uh, just to key off your last remark, uh, I, I think it, it's really worth thinking about these things uh, in ways uh, small and large. Uh, we we spend a lot of our time in meetings. Uh, are we actually running good meetings, uh, or do we groan? You know, do we make the best of our time, or you know, and how how can we take a bit of responsibility to make that work better? Uh, really at kind of a, a pretty small level. I, I, I really like what uh, Sibella was saying that it, it also goes to uh, being a, a learning organisation, having a learning mindset, wanting to get better at stuff. It involves uh, a whole bunch of kind of broader mechanisms of how you manage and lead teams. And that really does come down to the individual team level. So, you know, it's important to talk about it at the organisational level, but really overwhelmingly people's experience in the APS is shaped by what happens in their team. And thinking about the extent to which you are using that responsibility to create a bit of space, which is very, very hard. Like, don't get me wrong, it's really hard. And we've all talked about why it's hard, right? But, but how can you create a bit of space so that you can be a bit reflective? How can you try and think about uh, what Jessica said, which was absolutely fantastic? Learning is about connecting talking about things, sharing experience. That's why we talk about it in terms of craft in the APS Academy. It, it's very much that apprenticeship model of uh, learning from practice, understanding what's important, and really reflecting on that day to day after a meeting, after a brief, after a, you know, a particular interaction. W what did we learn from that? Where are we going? All of those sorts of things. I think it's incredibly important. At the APSC, we talk about a continuous learning model for exactly that idea, that some of your learning is in formal learning settings, but so much of it is about connecting, learning from practice, sharing, and creating a bit of space to be able to do that. And without being naive about that, all of us are pressed all the time. So it's really difficult to create that space, but it's really important and it's actually kind of satisfying. Like the, the, the team feedback is, very much that that's a better place to work as well. Yes, I couldn't agree more. Um, so thank you very much for that, Shubo. Another question, and again, we might stay with you because this is about mobility um, across the APS. Um, certainly, I can only imagine that one of the management committee in AGLNQ has shared this because we talk about uh, mobility and how we can make it happen more easily, uh, more frequently, uh, a, a lot of the time in, in management committee meetings. So with a new invigorated focus on building a high mobility APS workforce, besides the mobility register, what other avenues advice are open to us? Yeah, thanks AJ. So uh, we are doing some work on some support tools around this. Uh, there is a temporary opportunities uh, tool that, that is meant to help with this. We're trying to ease, I guess, some of the paperwork as well to allow people to come in and out more quickly and to make that less of a big deal than it might have been previously. It is difficult to get the match. It's, it's difficult to curate something that works at the kind of scale of the APS again. So while I think we're making some inroads in that, again, we're kind of conscious that that's something that particularly for larger agencies is often kind of more seamless within an agency. A again, with a mindset to say, this is actually something that we value, being able to move resources within an agency for to meet kind of surge requirements or to meet particular pressures can be a bit easier. But as I say, we're also thinking about that on a whole of service basis, but I just wouldn't want to overclaim that a whole of service instrument for that is, is going to solve it on a whole of service basis. Uh, it, it can make a contribution, but it's always going to be important for agencies to think about this as well. Yeah. yeah. 
thank you, Shubo. Certainly, um, I, I think your point about size of agency is a really important one. Um, certainly in the ABS, uh, we try and um, accept secondees into the ABS, as well as um, have a number of outposted offices across um, the APS. And that's a fantastic way for us to stay connected to the pulse of what's going on in different areas. But um, uh, certainly it's a great opportunity for those outposted offices to see a different agency, learn new things, um, as well as build their comms and engagement um, muscle, if you like. So um, that's certainly something that we do uh, in, in the ABS. Um, Sibylla, did you want to add anything uh, in terms of your own experience of mobility? Um, yeah, I guess I'd say the, the thing that complements um, the framework, so the framework's are a great step forward. Um, and as, um, as Sue has said, it's, it's part of the solution, but not everything. I think um, individuals taking accountability for, for their own pathway and where they might want to end up and being really proactive about moves that you want to make. Um, so um, through building networks in other agencies and contacts, that kind of thing to complement, um, knowing that knowing what tools and, and frameworks are there to support you in doing that. But trying to find your own path forward, I think is a really powerful um, part of that process and ultimately um, a bit of a, a success um, factor. So I think the, the things that are happening at the APS wide and the agency level are things that are enablers. Um, but taking those steps yourself to reach out, find out what other agencies are doing, where you might be interested, making those connections through the network opportunities that there are. Yeah, great. And and Jessica, you, you I'm sure you've got something to add here given your private sector and now public sector experience. Yeah, I, I think um, Sibyl's um, uh, comment around taking responsibility for your own um, path and your own career is really important. And there are some great tools. Um, the APS is very much like a big multinational corporate organisation, believe it or not. Um, I've worked in big corporates with over 200,000 employees and, um, uh, and we didn't have anywhere near the types of um, enablement and the tools and, and, and something like the APSC that actually helps facilitate um, those connections. Uh, it does really also come down to the management practices as well. And I do think, um, you know, the, the uh, using merit lists is an incredibly uh, important and um, thing that we can uh, do and sharing those proactively um, and for people to share them uh, it, as it happens by default. But, you know, it's start there, you know, uh, there's some everyday practice things that I think managers can do and people can do um, that would help facilitate that because there's some great experiences that can be shared. I, I, we've had, we as a small agency, we have a lot of people that come in and out um, and come onshore and offshore. Um, and we have a very dynamic workforce um, as an agency. And that brings a lot of change constantly. <laughs> but it brings a lot of experience to different groups at different points in time that adds a lot of value that makes a better services, better policy, better, better advice. And um, we're, we're better for it, but it doesn't, it doesn't make it easy, but it is something that you see the outcomes of on a daily basis too. Yeah. Sharing of merit lists is a, a great idea. Um, sometimes easier said than done in my experience, but still, um, if we set out with a goal in mind, you know, uh, like like Shubo was saying, gradually things are, are being uh, better enabled in terms of mobility. Um, but I think certainly through the AGLN uh, network, uh, there are other opportunities we can look at to facilitate that mobility um, across the footprint. Um, another question has come through. So, there has been a lot of, uh, Sibylla, I think you'll like this one. I, there has been a lot of research showing that a four day week increases productivity. As a model employer, will the APS trial this? So I might go to Shubo first, but then I would like to, to cut across to you, Sibylla. Shubo? Shubo? Thanks, AJ. So again, I think the, the basic principle here is to find arrangements that work uh, that are mutually beneficial. So the work for the individual, the work for the team and work for the organisation. 
And then that needs to be thought about in the context of the specific work uh, and where the, uh, uh, what's, what the outcome is that people are working towards. I think there are some arrangements where, you know, flexibility in different ways uh, just looks at location. There are some where flexibility in different ways looks at hours. There are, it really does depend so much on exactly where you are, what you're trying to do. But I think, as I, as I mentioned before, a, a mindset that, that starts with a kind of conversation and thinking about how that might apply in different places uh, and tries to think about how you can try and make that work for everyone concerned, I think is a, is a good way to think about it. Now, I think it is important as we talk about that to, to really give weight to all parts of that mutually beneficial that I was talking about before. There are genuinely some important uh, objectives for an organisation in making sure there is a sense of shared organisational culture. And there's also a lot of research that says face-to-face -face contact in different ways is incredibly important to build various forms of connection. Part of what we've talked about in the panel is a lot of learning is informal and it's in the margins of other things that you're looking to do. Now, you can look to replicate some of that online, stay on for an extra few minutes after a team call or something like that. But it's also the case that it's difficult to get those kind of by chance interactions online in a way that fully replicates what happens in person. Now, th th these are balancing factors. We we've just got to think about them in the whole, but we've got to think about them in the whole in a form that uh, is, is disposed towards trying to make different things work in a way that utilises people's potential. Yes, yeah. agreed. Um, but it's certainly in the ABS, uh, I've seen an increase just in the last 12 months of people looking to do a nine day fortnight um, and negotiating obviously with their, their team and their manager around what would work, doing it for a trial period, having that kind of, you know, two months in, is it working? What do we need to do to recalibrate? Um, Sibylla, I know you and I talked uh, a little bit about the decision that you made to go uh, nine days a fortnight. Um, I wondered whether or not you would feel comfortable sharing, you know, some of the things that you needed to work through and different thing, uh, decisions you needed to make to, to make this happen. Yeah, sure, AJ, happy to, to go there. Um, just before I do, I was just going to say in terms of the APS moving to a four day week, um, my my sense would be that you know that might be a thing of the future um, as broader as the broader economy perhaps makes that shift. You know there were when you look at the history of this, um, you know moving from six days to five days. You know there was a broader sort of shift there and lots of things that had to happen for for that to work. So who knows? Like maybe maybe it's on the cards. Maybe it's in our future. Um, and certainly there's um, there is lots of research out there and is one of my big curious um, podcast threads that I've gone down is you know finding out more about this four day a week um, movement and what they talk a lot about there is um, there's a whole movement around trying to push for four day a week more broadly. They, they talk about starting with the teams, again, coming back to Shivo's comments, starting with the teams to find how you're going to make this work. If you know if a, a company decides they're going to trial the full day at four day, it's about giving it to the teams to work out where are the levers, how are we going to get the same amount of work done in four days instead of five. So it's, you know, there's, there's a lot out there and it's really interesting. So I'd suggest reading up on it. Um, in my, my own experience, so yeah, as AJ said, and as I said earlier, I, I went to a nine day fortnight um, late last year. Best thing I've ever done, I'll say that again. <laughs> um, and it, I did actually go a little bit part-time. You know, there's, a, there's one option that a lot of people in ABS do is do the same amount of hours in nine days instead of 10. I decided to go partly part-time and a little bit of extra hours each day, just um, just being realistic about the number of hours I could manage a day with um, with kids and aging parents and that kind of thing that you sort of have on outside of work. But where I, so I knew I had to find a certain amount of time um, to cut from my workload. I didn't want to, um, I didn't want to burden the team. That was not one of my, uh, my objectives was I don't want to just do this by pushing a whole bunch more stuff down, even though the team were awesome and said, well, give it to us because it's a development opportunity for us when you give us things. But what I actually did, and it was actually incredibly scarily easily once I actually um, did it, was just step back and look at my, going back to our meetings conversation earlier, 
having a look at my meeting schedule and the things that I was um, attending and, and part of and sort of making that call of, do I need to be there? Am I going to have an impact? Am I going to learn something? Am I going to connect to people? You know, asking those sort of basic questions and actually coming to the realisation there were a bunch of things that I was involved with where actually I was going along because I'd been invited and hadn't sort of taken that moment to step back and go, well, actually, do I need to be there? You know, for all those reasons, there's a bunch of different reasons you might go to a meeting. But once I took that critical lens, I was actually able to find the time that I needed to to. Um, find my reduction in working hours that I needed to with my new arrangements it was incredibly easy so um, yeah once I guess that goes back to the broader conversation as we shift more broadly as a society perhaps towards a four-day model it's you know having um, working together to sort of step back and go well, where are those opportunities to work smarter so we can actually achieve the same amount of outcomes in the shorter space of time. Yeah fantastic and as I said you know I can certainly see across the ABS, more and more people kind of lo looking at those levers and looking for options to get a better balance between their work life and their personal life. Um, and, you know, as you've shared, by and large, with a bit of thinking through, um, it, it's actually been quite easy to do. Um, even my exec assistant is now doing a nine day uh, a fortnight and that, that scared me a lot because I rely on her so much, um, but it's actually working really well for her, uh, for myself and for our team. Um, Jessica, did you have anything to add in this space? Uh, just a maybe a cautionary tale. Uh, I, I have seen this done where there hasn't been the right culture or management support in place where people have ended up going to some type of flexible or a part-time arrangement and all that's happened, and this is in the private sector, I should say, I have not seen this happen here in the public sector, um, where those people have, and um, increasingly women, I would say, uh, it has happened that they've gone part-time and ended up working full-time and getting paid part-time. That is not success. It is not success when you are part-time but you're working full-time hours or you don't have the flexibility that you've asked and you're not supported by your team management and the culture of the organisation that doesn't facilitate that. So it really does come back down to the type of work and the person and the context, but also the culture. And uh, it's just something that I think is really important to acknowledge that um, that needs to be in place as those supporting structures to support this flexibility as well. Not to say that it doesn't exist, but it can happen and it requires active oversight. Thanks. Yep, absolutely. That That's a very good caution. Um, and I think, you know, throughout the panel session, we're constantly coming back to culture and mindset, communication, being on the same page and thinking things through, right? Really thinking things through. So thank you. Another question has come through, so I'll keep going. Um, how can the APS remain competitive in the current skill shortage environment? Um, something that I know the ABS is constantly reflecting on. Uh, Shubo, can I hand to you for an initial response? Yeah, thanks, AJ. So, look, I, I think the the basics are, of course, to think about uh, pay and terms and conditions. So, of course, we need to make sure that we are competitive on that, uh, both in a general sense, but also in terms of some specialist skill sets. So, we need to think about what that looks like in a in a sensible way. And I know that the government and the the bargaining process, of course, is very cognizant of that. I think uh, more broadly, I mentioned that we're doing some work on the employee value proposition and we're looking to perhaps be a bit more explicit about what is really special about being a public servant. I, I've always thought it was a real privilege to be a public servant and I think maybe drawing out a little bit more of why it is a particular purpose, uh, why it is a, a, a vocation uh, and why making a contribution in that kind of way can be incredibly rewarding. I, th I think really talking a bit more explicitly about that, talking about the spirit of service, talking about what we're about as a public service is also important. Uh, in addition to the basics that I talked about before, I think there are so many rewarding career pathways in the public service. It's such a, a varied and fantastic 
uh, place to be. There is a chance to make a contribution and a real contribution in a way that makes a tangible difference to the lives of people. I think talking about that uh, externally, uh, really trying to bring out the ways in which we do contribute to broader Australian society, economy uh, and community life is a good way of thinking about it. And then also, I think, uh, making sure that uh, that is done in, in an appropriate context, if I can put it that way, that says making a contribution, it might be for a period of your life, it might be for a relatively short stint, or it might be for a long career, but really trying to bring out also that sense that, uh, th that there is a, a sense of service and it's a sense of service that can be discharged in many different ways, but can be incredibly rewarding. Thanks, Shubo. As you were talking, I'm, I, I'm reminding myself of, um, I'm going to use the word pride. Sometimes you have to be careful about being proud, but the pride that I have every day, I come to, to work for the Australian Bureau of Statistics because we do make a difference to the country. You know, I look after um, standards and classifications that are Australia's standard for occupation or standard for industry. And that really shapes how data and statistics um, is delivered and its quality and its currency. And, and you know, I, I do um, take that, that responsibility very seriously. Um, Jessica, did you want to uh, add anything on this question? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to um, share my personal experience. As I said, I have, I've only joined the public service nearly five years ago. Um, both my mum and dad had worked in the public service at various points in time over the course of their career. Um, it probably wasn't on my list of things to do when I thought about my life and my career in, in, in the profession that I'm in. And I've been working very happily and successfully in various um, corporate organisations and feeling quite happy and fulfilled. Um, then I, someone reached out from Austrade because they were looking for a head of global communications um, and said, are you interested in, in this role? Because I had a very diverse um, skill set working across quite a number of uh, industries, including professional services, um, tourism, um, in technology, et cetera. And what attracted me was, oh, okay, well, it's a job where I can use all of the experiences that I've had across my career. Um, and, but really, the more, and the more people that I met, the more impressed that I was by the calibre of the people that were working at Austrade and their professionalism, their experience and their desire to make a difference. Um, the reason I continued to follow on and went through a very competitive process um, was because what really attracted to me was that I could do what I'm good at, what I'm passionate about. The agency needed someone in that role to do that. And there was an opportunity to make a difference for the organisation. But the way that we measure our success as an agency is by the number of trade and investment outcomes that we deliver for Australian businesses. And that means more jobs, more economic prosperity for those businesses that hire more people and, and can help solve some of the world's biggest problems. And we also have a leading role, a policy role in helping rebuild the visitor economy. And very, very long time ago, I actually did tourism at uni. So it's this really strange, wonderful mix of everything that I've done and everything that I'm passionate about all in one agency, but doing it in a way that is at the utmost integrity and the way that you do it has to be exemplary. And um, for me, that was something, that's a really good challenge. Now, it was pretty scary though, when you have to go and then give evidence at Senate estimates, I'm not gonna lie. You sort of go, what did I get myself in for? <laughs> but it's such, what it makes me realize is what a privilege it is to be doing this work, to be held to those standards, to be delivering those outcomes. Um, that is something that you cannot buy in the private sector. And I've worked for lots of different types of organisations. You cannot get that fulfilment from making money for shareholders and for other people. It, it, it only exists in the APS. Um, and it's not, but it's not for everyone, right? 
but it is something that where you are driven by that and by that purpose, it is something that we can really bring to life. And it's different in different agencies in the way that we help people and the work that we do. But every single member of this service is playing their part in helping us make Australia a better place. Um, and uh, it's something that we should lean into uh, and, and be proud of. Uh, but it's certainly why I chose to come and work in the public service and why I've stayed for quite some time and why I'm not done yet. I've still got plenty I want to do, <laughs> not going anywhere um, in terms of the work that we do. And there's a lot, so much potential um, for us to, to do more and to do better. So it's a wonderful thing to be a part of and it's a great privilege. Yeah. And Jessica, again, as you were talking, I, I was thinking about the the stories we saw earlier on the APS you know it's how how do we package that experience and the way that we make a difference um, and share it with potential uh, employees and and I think the APSC is on the right track uh, in terms of this. Uh, Sibylla did you want to add anything from your perspective? No, thanks, AJ. I think Jessica said it brilliantly. I think we should end on that. <laughs> Excellent. Great. All right, I have another question, um, and this one's a little provoking, so um, I, I will take my time and read it slowly. Uh, we seem to talk the talk when it comes to psychosocial health incidents, but not walk the walk. What can we do to show staff it isn't just talk? Can I stay with you, Sibylla? Put you on the spot. Yeah, sure. Um, it's a great question. Thank you very much for whoever asked that question. I think it's a really important one. Goes to something else I'm really passionate about, which is um, wellbeing. Um, I can talk about some of the experience um, in my, my team, um, the way that we do that. Um, we try to I guess build that well-being um, and psychological safety into all that we do. We make it a, a topic of conversation when we get together as a broader team. Um, it's a it's a regular feature of our leadership meetings, um, checking in on well-being. We do um, a regular sort of once a month, very short, sharp. Um, wellbeing survey, we call it, where we just sort of touch base with three or four questions for, for everyone in the branch, just to sort of get a, that litmus test of how people are feeling, including, um, you know, any challenges that they're having. So by really making it a focus in all, in all that we do, um, sharing resources, um, coming back to it um, time and time again, we're hoping that that's one way that makes it more of a visible, you know, this is actually something that we do care about. We do focus on this. We do want to make a difference um, just by normalising that conversation. So that's something that um, that we've done that seems to be working well. Great. Um, certainly my own personal experience through COVID, it was utmost at the, it was at the top of the the list, right, Sibylla? You know, we were constantly checking in with one another um, to make sure even at our level that we were okay, as well as with our teams. And I think it's just continued. Um, it, it, while it was an awful experience to go through, it probably has really shored up um, the importance of, of health and wellbeing um, for staff and really taking that seriously. Jessica, did you want to share anything from your own experience and how to walk the walk? <laughs> um, I think it's really important that as, as leaders that we uh, demonstrate vulnerability and be bring our whole selves to work. We don't always have the answers <laughs> and it's okay. We're all human beings, but um, be yourself. Um, and know when you're out of your depth and ask for help. Someone else might have experience that you don't have that someone else might have, but seek others and, and connect. And there's such a depth and breadth of capability right across uh, the APS and, and within organisations and probably even within your teams that it's important to tap into. I think it's also really important to role model by the behaviour that you want to see in terms of taking leave. Uh, I myself recently just um, 
at, went on holidays and I completely checked out. I didn't, I turned my phone off. Um, there was obviously someone acting for me, uh, et cetera, but I was gone. I was on holidays and I told everyone, my holidays are coming up. I am off um, on a crazy adventure and now I'm back. And I thanked everyone because it's really important that everyone knows that when I'm off, I'm off. Um, and when you're off, I want you to be off too. And I want you to do the things that um, you need to do to give yourself that break. And it's, I think th those things can be really powerful. The third point I wanted to make was never underestimate the role that you can play in um, uh, addressing unacceptable behaviours. And as managers, leaders, and it doesn't, uh, it's important, but as it is for every single member of the APS. Dealing with microaggressions, this is not about hierarchy, this is about culture and those unacceptable behaviours of bullying, harassment and discrimination have no place um, in, in any workplace. And it's really important that we uh, acknowledge and, and address those behaviours. And if you need help, um, there's plenty of support that's available in different agencies, have different setups, and there's EAPs and the APSC, and you can talk to your manager or HR, et cetera. But acknowledge, and, and where they exist, acknowledging them and talking to people, we know this is happening, this is what we're going to do about it, and asking your staff if that is making a difference. They are very simple things that you can do. Don't sweep it under the carpet. Don't try and go, oh, everything's fine here. Face into those issues, create those psychologically safe places where you can have those conversations and address those unacceptable behaviours through the mechanisms and the support that's available to you is absolutely critical. And I think that also leads into the wellbeing piece. So they're the three things I just would add in, in how can we actually, so the question was, how do we actually walk the talk? I'd say there are three things that can be practically done. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you, Jessica. Very, very um, wise reflections. Um, certainly one of the other simple things that, that we're trying to do in my team is um, check-ins at the beginning of meetings. You know, just really checking in on how people are. And it's been absolutely instructive because sometimes people are not in not having a good day or they're not feeling well and you know immediately and, and then you adapt accordingly. So um, just another um, thought uh, from my own personal experience. Last question, and I'm mindful we've only got six minutes. So Could I'm, I just I'm, come in of very course. quickly? Sorry, yes. yes. no, um, no. But I, I just wanted to mention uh, that the APSC does have a mental health and suicide prevention unit. Uh, which also provides resources. The role of that unit is to work with agencies and to think about how agencies are best set up in this space, but it is such an important space as uh, people have already been saying. Uh, th there is a, a, an online uh, learning offering called Compassionate Foundations, which I'd really strongly recommend to people. Uh, again, we can provide the detail through the chat, uh, but it's a way that people can connect to these issues. And I just wanted to uh, particularly back in uh, both what Sibylla and Jess, Jessica had said, but particularly that point about um, we talk a lot about authentic leadership and authentic leadership is about really bringing the whole of yourself to, uh, to your leadership task and thinking about showing, well, showing your vulnerability, showing the whole self, but also through authentic leadership, that's not a licence to, to behave badly. And so I think thinking really carefully about then our mutual responsibility to make sure that we are setting the place up in the way that we want it to be, that we all want it to be, uh, and that, uh, what's the saying, the, the, the standard you walk past is the standard you accept. I think that, that is a really grave responsibility on all of us. So I, I just wanted to put that out there as well, that it is, it is something that, is just so important. I think the conversation around wellbeing has changed so much for the better. Uh, and we are now in serious conversations about what that means in individual teams, in workplaces, but there is a really quite grave responsibility on all of us to keep moving on that journey. And as I say, there are some resources that we can offer as well. Thanks, Shubo. Um, I should have thrown to you, and I was not aware of the Mental Health and Suicide Prevention Unit um, in the APSC, so really um, important 
uh, to know that as well as about the the capability. What was that? Compa compassionate, compassionate Compassionate Foundations. foundations. But yes. we'll, we'll, we'll supply the details through the, the chat. We do have one more question, but we are running out of time. So I think as MC, I'm going to leave that question for um, the APSC to respond to perhaps um, when they send material around. Um, so look, I'd really just want to thank uh, Shubo, Jessica and Sibylla. It's been a fantastic panel session. Um, certainly some great ideas shared uh, as well as um, uh, some takeouts for me. Um, some snippets and I hope that everybody online has learned something or has something to take away with them. So I, I would also like to thank all of you for watching and contributing to the State of the Service Roadshow Queensland event. Before we sign out today, I would like to take the opportunity to share with people a quick note on the Australian Government Leaders Leadership Network, of which I'm Chair uh, of the Queensland Group. If you're not aware, this leadership network sees APS staff of an EL1 level and above coming together regularly, both in person and virtually, to discuss ideas like we have been today and to connect. It's a great way to find out what is happening in other departments and to broaden your professional network. In Queensland, because we're amazing, we have two networks, AGLN Queensland and AGLN North Queensland. If you are interested in hearing more, you can sign up via the APSC website. The APS events team will put the URL in the chat function now. Keep an eye out for the follow-up email from today's session as well. It will have information about how you can share your story of working in the APS, like the stories we saw earlier today. It will also have a link to the recording of today's session and the State of the Service Roadshow will continue with events this week uh, for our New South Wales, Tasmania, Western Australian uh, based colleagues. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Mm -hmm.